Plastic is everywhere, in bottles, packaging and many other everyday objects. Yet not all plastics are created equal. Plastics are a large family of different materials, each with its own properties, applications and health and environmental impacts. In the last two modules I've been working on the project of compiling an overview of the plastic types pervasives in our daily lives and thus of providing reliable information to support consumers in their purchase decisions. The approach I have taken draws from conceptual documentary. While I'm generally happy with the visual output created, the strictly structured approach imposed tight limits and demanded a lot of precision, ultimately slowing down my production considerably. In addition, a question that keeps me thinking has remained unanswered, namely whether and how I can use photography as a medium to share, experience or even generate knowledge in a way that goes beyond simply illustrating research themes. The starting point for my work in this module was a piece of information I came across while working on the recyclability of plastic packaging. Prerequisite to ensure efficient recycling of PT bottles are transparent or light colored bottles. For high quality recycling, PT bottles must be sorted by color. Dark and opaque colors interfere with the optical sorting process using near infrared technology and reduce the quality of recycling fractions. The fact that sorting machines using near-infrared technology cannot detect dark and opaque PET bottles led me to the idea, in the sense of an experimental approach, to explore the plastic objects and their properties by exposing them to different optical processing and capturing procedures. As early as 1903, French scientist Henri Becquerel found ways to visually capture examples of radiation and radioactivity. These were science experiments but they resulted in visual representations of physical properties. Maybe there are other things we can do in the photographic realm that are more abstract in nature and that can be explored in those terms. The sorting of PT bottles using near-infrared technology led me to infrared photography. I didn't convert my camera, but worked with an infrared filter that blocks the visible part of the light and lets through only light in the infrared range. The Irish photographer Richard Mossy subverts conventional media narratives through new technologies to unhinge the representative criteria of photography, in his case war photography. For Infra, a series documenting the civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, he uses this continued infrared film, a technology originally designed for military and scientific use to make objects visible that cannot ordinarily be perceived by the human eye. By representing the conflict with an invisible spectrum of infrared light, he pushes us to see this tragedy in new ways. With his methodology, based on his conviction that conventional documentary photography simply cannot depict the complicated and often obscure contexts behind the modern globalized world, Mossy questions the potential and limitations of photography itself. At the shortwave end of the visible light spectrum, we find ultraviolet light. UV photography requires special lenses and filters on a converted camera. Since I do not have the necessary special equipment for UV photography, I have decided to approach the matter by so-called ultraviolet-induced visible fluorescence photography in a first step. Thereby, photography is not done in the UV spectrum, but by reflections caused by UV light. Needed for this procedure is a special lamp that emits only UV light and a very, very dark room. UV light is harmful. It is highly recommended to use appropriate eye and skin protection at all times when doing UV-induced visible fluorescence photography, high-quality UV protective goggles and dark-colored non-fluorescent clothes. In the words of Craig Burroughs, ultraviolet-induced visible fluorescence photography reveals secrets that we can't see but that still play an important role in nature. And it is therefore important that these things remind us to keep exploring our world and looking for things that are ignored or unobserved. According to Peter Jenny, it is by alienating everyday objects that things become tangible to the senses. This consideration led me to work in the macro range in order to get close to the explored objects and thus being able to capture fine details and textures that are usually lost to our eyes. What the approaches described have in common is that they all attempt in some way to capture what is lost to human vision. What they also have in common is that they all are very technical. As a result, I found myself focusing heavily on the technology and doing little to explore the objects I actually wanted to capture. Therefore, during the course of the module, I decided to free myself from the technique and to explore cameraless approaches. So I started experimenting with cyanotypes and photograms. Objects like plastic bottles or cosmetic containers are not easy to press and put on paper. So for this work, I tried to go beyond the simple silhouette 
and to exploit their shadows, reflections and translucence. An almost bottomless source of creative inspiration is Pierre Dubreuil, a French photographer who, as early as 1911, took abstracts from shadows. Or Alvin Coburn, who also at the beginning of the last century was playing with shadows, playing with mirrors, playing with exposure, playing with various techniques. I think, in terms of sustainability, the record of my project is acceptable. I worked at home with everyday objects, with equipment I already had to the largest extent. Basically, the only thing I had to buy was an IR filter, actually made in Japan. I was able to borrow both the UV light source and the scanner I needed to scan the cyanotypes and photograms. I did not print out anything, post-processing and editing was all done digitally. The greatest potential for optimization is in the development of the photograms. I did experiment with a Coffinal C developer. The resulting images were clearly limited in tonal value and contrast compared to the classically developed ones. Considering the effort I put into exposures and detailed photographs, I felt the loss was too important. I worked with a paper developer without hydroquinone. All that. The development with Coffinal C definitely has potential, but I would need more time to optimize it. I think the free and loose form of a sign does the most justice to the chaotic and somewhat exuberant nature of this project. So I have laid out a prototype sign and published it online. However, I have refrained from printing the sign without any need, not least because of sustainability considerations. Well, regarding the initial question, if and how I can use photography as a medium to share or even generate knowledge in a way that goes beyond simply illustrating research themes, I didn't find the answer in this module either. The approach is explored, encouraged to reflect that reality comprises more than what can be seen by human eyes, and also to question the potential and limits of photography. The approach is seems suitable for capturing phenomena outside of visual perception. However, the translation into a visual representation accessible to our perception is subject to the subjective interpretation and the subjective decisions of the author and thus cannot satisfy the scientific demand for verifiability and repeatability. The relief from a strictly structured approach and the result open floating along with the flow of the process was fun, however, and released a lot of creative energy. What I will take with me is that the new and the unexpected can only emerge if I allow for sufficient space for the uncertain and for sufficient air for the process to breathe.